Welcome to the third module in the APCRO Health System Sciences Curriculum, Healthcare Economics and Cost-Effectiveness Analysis. The objectives for this module are as follows. Describe the current state of healthcare and costs in the United States. Review principles of healthcare economics. Discuss using utilities and costs to compare interventions. Design a basic cost-effectiveness analysis and identify the role and calculate a budget impact model. So why is it important for a physician to understand cost in healthcare? Well, first of all, the U.S. spends massive amounts of money on healthcare on the order of $3.65 trillion in 2018, or more than the entire gross domestic product of the U.K. and more than twice the gross domestic product of Canada. Despite all this spending, the United States continues to have worse health outcomes than many other countries that spend far less than us on health care. So it is extremely important for the U.S. in particular to identify effective interventions that will also get us the most bang for our buck. And last, cost is not just important on these large national levels, but also to implement change on smaller scales. Whether it's new operating room technology or a new medication, stakeholders care about cost data. It's not enough for the intervention to be right, it also has to be affordable and sustainable. The reality is, resources are finite and we cannot simply fund every great evidence-based, scientifically proven idea. The reasons for this are best understood through some principles of healthcare economics, which we'll review now. Health economics is defined as a study of how scarce resources are allocated among alternative uses for the care of sickness and the promotion, maintenance, and improvement of health, including the study of how healthcare and health-related services, their costs and benefits, and health itself are distributed among individuals and groups in society. Or in short, the goal of utilitarian economics is to provide the most good for the greatest number of people while balancing certain other economic truths. These include scarcity, the reality that resources are limited, opportunity cost, where spending resources on one program ultimately means they can't be used for another, efficiency, the theory that we should choose the programs that get us the greatest benefit for the least dollars, and finally equity, the principle of fair distribution of resources or benefits among different individuals or groups. So balancing all these things together, how do we navigate this complex health policy or health economics decision making? Well, how do we make decisions in general for ourselves? Oftentimes that involves stepping back and drafting something as simple as a pros and cons list of the relative benefits and downsides of a choice. A cost effectiveness analysis is actually not all that different, except instead of pros, we call the benefits of an intervention utilities, and instead of cons, we might call the downsides or what we have to sacrifice for an intervention costs. Or, for the formal economists in the room, as defined by the British Medical Journal, a utility is a measure of the amount of benefit obtained from consuming goods and services, and the definition of cost is the value of the best opportunity foregone as a result of engaging resources in an activity. Cost is relatively straightforward. Getting health care costs is not, and deciding whether to get down to the nitty-gritty, called micro-costing, when planning a real cost-effectiveness analysis is not easy. But in terms of how to measure it, that's easy. Currency. Or in the United States, dollars. So just like for cost, for utilities, we need a standard, quantifiable unit of health that is comparable across disease states. Enter the quali. So what is a quali? A quality-adjusted life year, or a year of health adjusted for the degree of health in which it's lived. So one quali equals one year in perfect health, zero qualies equals death, and everything else is somewhere in between. But let's look at this in more detail. We already said that one quali equals one year lived in perfect health. But what, for example, is half a quali? Well, it could be one year lived at half mass, say with a significant debilitating medical condition. For example, receiving chemotherapy for ovarian cancer is considered 0.5 quali. It could also be 0.5 of a year lived in perfect health than dying. What are some examples of other real-world qualies that have been quantified? Stroke, for example, has a 0.65 quali. There are complex methods, which we won't go into here, that have been used to calculate thousands of qualies for pneumonia, hypertension, HIV, and many other health states, giving us a standardized currency around which we can discuss health utility or benefit. So that was qualies. So why bother with all of these? Well, now that we have our currency in order, we can actually use this currency to build a decision analysis of our own. 
So we'll start by building a decision analysis based on a really simple day-to-day -day decision we all have to make, though less often here in Los Angeles, which is, should I pack an umbrella today? I'll start by setting the scene here with a few assumptions. Number one, there's a 20% chance of rain. Number two, we don't like getting rained on. And number three, we also don't like carrying around an umbrella for no reason. And as we think of the different end games in this scenario of bringing versus not bringing an umbrella and it raining or not raining, they might look like this. So the happiest version of me living my best life is running around unburdened and with no rain. This is going to be our quality of one. Our second happiest scenario would be to carry around an umbrella and it doesn't rain. So it was unnecessary, but a little annoying. So this is going to be a quality of 0 0.95. Scenario number three is where we have an umbrella and it's raining, which is not fun because, you know, rain. But on the other hand, feeling pretty self-satisfied because we had the umbrella, so quality of 0 0.9. And last, taking the risk of going umbrella-less and getting drenched, not happy, quality 0 0.4. So here I'm going to give you in advance the scaffolding of how our decision analysis will look so we can go through the parts themselves. Starting with the horizontal lines, each of these corresponds to an event. The events then lead into these shapes called nodes, which will then branch, and the kind of branching and shape depends on what kind of node it is. The square represents a decision node, meaning we're making a decision at it. The circles are probability or chance nodes. And finally, at the end of every terminal branch of the tree is a terminal node. So let's get into drawing our own. This is the point, if you would, go ahead and get out your own pen and paper, and to the instructor, you can pause here if people need a second to do that. Okay, we're back. So let's start by jotting down these little notes in the bottom left corner. You'll remember these were the probabilities and utilities we'd already discussed. A 20% chance of rain, or in probability terms, 0 0.2, and then the relative utilities of each of the different endgames. So you, no um, no rain, translates to non-coders as utility of no umbrella, no rain, or the carefree living scenario where the quality was 1. No umbrella getting rained was 0 0.4, and so forth for the two umbrella carrying states. So let's start by drawing that horizontal line here to begin our tree, on which we'll write our central question, should we bring an umbrella? And since this starts with a question, we then have to make a decision, so we then draw our next point, which will be a decision node. The decision node will then branch into two possible decisions, it can be many more than this, but in this example, it's just two. We can leave it behind, or we can bring the umbrella. So starting with the top branch here, if we leave the umbrella behind, there are two distinct possibilities, or chances, which means we now need a chance or a probability node. Those two possibilities are either that it doesn't rain, or that it rains. And you'll recall from earlier, or from the bottom left here, that we decided the probability it was going to rain was 20% or 0 0.2, so we will write that here under rain, and meaning the chance that it's not going to rain is 80% or 0 0.8, so we'll write that up there. And since each of these represents the end of their branch in the decision tree, we'll cap each of them off with a little terminal node right on the end. As we turn our attention now to the bottom branch where we bring an umbrella, you'll see that actually the architecture looks really similar because the possibilities are the same, and the probability of it raining or not is the same. So actually, you basically just copy and paste that branch down here. The last thing to add for the general architecture of our tree are the utilities themselves for the different outcomes, which I'll just pull from the bottom left and jot down the variable names over here. Great, so there you have it, our beautiful decision tree. The next step is to calculate out the arms. So now, take a deep breath, because there is going to be some math, but I promise you it's very gentle. For each terminal branch, you simply multiply the probability of going down that path by the utility at the end of that path. So for the very topmost branch, the 0 0.8 probability times the utility value of 1 at the end equals 0 0.8. And for the others, the probability of 0 0.2 that it does rain times a utility of 0 0.4 in the scenario where you leave the umbrella and get rained on, that comes out to 0 0.08. Third branch now, the probability of 0 0.8 that it doesn't rain, times a utility of 0 0.95 in the unnecessary umbrella scenario, that comes out to 0 0.76. And finally, with a probability of 0 0.2 that it does rain, times a utility of 0 0.9, 
in the self-satisfied scenario where you bring an umbrella and stay dry, that comes out to 0 0.18. So this gives us the value of each of the terminal branch of each of the arms. But that's not really our question. Our question is where do we go from that initial decision node of leaving the umbrella versus bringing it? So we need to compare the values of the whole arms to one another. To get that, we have to simply add up the values at the terminal nodes. In the case of the leave it arm, this is 0 0.8 plus 0 0.08, so the value for the whole leave it arm is 0 0.88. Next, we'll do the same for the bringing it arm. We add up the values of the terminal nodes, 0 0.76 plus 0 0.18 to get 0 0.94 as the value for the whole bringing it arm. And since 0 0.94 is more than 0 0.88, it means the bring it arm yields greater happy points overall than the leave it arm, thus take the umbrella. I'll pause here for about 10 seconds so you can look through this in a little more detail. So that was fun performing a decision analysis and all, or in this case, since we did it with utilities and effectiveness analysis, but what about the cost component? Well, it's actually relatively easy to relate to. What if for some reason you were absolutely against owning an umbrella so that you instead paid your roommate $10 each time you wanted to take the umbrella out? Well, now this complicates things. When it was just about utilities and benefits, it was clear after our calculations which was the winning arm. But now you have to ask the question, is it worth it? Let's remind ourselves of the value 0 0.88 for the leaving it arm and 0 0.94 for the bring the umbrella arm. So to be able to make these calculations, we'll have to scale this up. So imagine that you live that decision analysis and cost scenario every day for a year. In the leaving it arm, in other words, you lived 0 0.88 version of your best self over a whole year, then you would have accrued over that year 0 0.88 quality. Similarly, for the bringing it arm, living 0 0.94 of your best self, every day you would accrue 0 0.94 of a quality for the entire year. So now let's add cost in. Well, leaving it is free all year long, but for the bringing it arm, this would cost you $10, but remember we're rerunning this scenario every day, so that's 10 bucks for the whole year, and that's 3650 for the whole year. Next, we'll calculate the incremental cost being paid, in this case, $3,650 minus $0, and divide it by the incremental benefit being gained over that same year, 0 0.94 minus 0 0.88 qualities in this case. And off the top of my head, that is $60,833 that we're paying per quality gained. And this value, calculating the incremental cost divided by the incremental effectiveness gained, has a very special term in economics called the ICER, or Incremental Cost Effectiveness Ratio. The ICER is used in a number of fields when evaluating new drugs, devices, and other new technology to determine whether it is considered cost effective. And though the exact threshold to decide if something is cost effective varies by country, by benchmark, and by intervention, a commonly used threshold is less than $100,000 per quality meaning that if the incremental cost spent is less than $100,000 per quality gained, then the intervention is considered cost effective. So in other words, for our silly umbrella example, the incremental cost of $60,833 per quality is considered an acceptable amount to spend for the quality gained and would be considered cost effective. So to summarize then, cost effectiveness analyses allow you to choose the best strategy among competing choices, as well as help decide whether or not to implement a novel strategy. They don't, however, incorporate the prevalence of the disease or the overall budget impact. To do that, we come to our last section, budget impact analysis. To understand how these things differ, I like to think of a cost-effectiveness analysis as answering the question, should we do it? Whereas a budget impact analysis answers the question, can we do it? A budget impact analysis differs importantly from a cost effectiveness analysis in that it takes into account the prevalence of a condition, as you can see in the formula here. I know, more formulas. So to know the impact of an intervention on a budget, we start with how much treatment will cost and multiply that by how many people will be affected by the condition, i.e. how many are going to need the treatment, divided by the total number of people helping pay for this. To understand this better, let's go back to our silly umbrella example. So let's say you've gotten together a commune of a thousand people who think like you and don't like to pay for umbrellas, but are willing to be a part of the greater umbrella membership plan. You'll recall it's 10 bucks an umbrella, 
but it turns out that only 20% of people were planning to ever step foot outside, so that the intervention only really applies to 20% of our total population. So therefore, running the fancy math, this will come out to about $2 per person of budget impact. Budget impact analyses are often used to calculate whether to bring interventions or drugs to formulary for insurance companies or accountable care organizations, hence the desire to calculate on a per member basis. So that wraps up our session for today. We hope you'll be able to describe why costs and economics are important in healthcare, as well as the basics of understanding and developing cost effectiveness analyses and budget impact models.